Well, folks, I think uh, we'll get ourselves underway. Welcome to Eden's second webinar in our series celebrating Open Education Week. We have another webinar later in the day for those of you who have enough uh, time and energy to take in two in the one day. Um, we're really delighted that you could join us. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing you shortly to today's panel and hosting hopefully a lively discussion on finding open education nuggets. My name is Mark Brown. Uh, I'm treasurer of Eden, but I also serve as the director of the National Institute for Digital Learning at Dublin City University. Before I introduce um, my colleagues and the specific focus of today's discussion, this is just a reminder to you to post your questions and comments or even any links in the chat box. Um, it's also helpful though, if you're going to pose quite specific questions that you use the Q&A feature for that. That just helps us to manage the questions and also to respond to them. Some of the panelists may be able to do that whilst um, others are talking. We'll endeavor to certainly try to respond and take as many of your questions as possible during the next um, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so. And remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question. You, like, you might like to start uh, also by just letting us know where you're from in the chat box, um, if you like, and where you're joining us from today it would be interesting. Without, I think, any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Innes, Vim and Maraid, our panellists. Instead of embarrassing them um, by reading out their formal, formal bios, um, they're actually on the website anyway, I'd rather hand over the mic as quickly as possible and give them the opportunity to briefly tell us a little about their background themselves. And I suppose uh, since I have some slides here for today's session, we may as well start in the order from um, starting with Innes. Um, I'm gonna hand over and ask you just to briefly give us a little intro. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to join you this morning. Um, I am Ines Gilhaurena, and I am here as editor of, of Open Praxis, which is an open access journal published by the International Council for since 2012, so more, more than eight years now. And I'm, I'm also an associate professor at the Faculty of Education at the Spanish National Distance Education University, UNED, Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia. And in relation to Eden, um, I have been collaborating with Eden for some years, and I'm currently, I am a member of the Eden NAP Steering Committee. I think that's enough, Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much, and apologies for a little bit of uh, distraction going on there in the background. Um, Bim, do you want to give us a little introduction? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, my name is Wim van Petegem. Uh, I work at uh, the University of Leuven in Belgium. Um, I've been a member of the Eden community since uh, the mid-90s, I think. Um, and um, I'm here today as the chief editor uh, of the EuroDL, uh, the journal uh, of uh, Eden. Um, the, I have to say that I'm uh, recently appointed editor-in-chief uh, and I step in the footsteps of uh, uh, Uli Bernat and uh, Alan Tate, uh, who were the previous uh, chief editors. Um, I think that's enough for uh, as an introduction. Uh, Thank you very much. And my colleague, Mairead. Hi, Mark. Uh, good to be here this morning. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm here on behalf of um, the International Journal of Educational Technology and Higher Education. Um, I'm an associate professor in Dublin City University. Um, I lecture in IT. I'm also the head of the Ideas Lab at the National Institute of Digital Learning. I suppose another thing that I stress is that I also am a reviewer for quite a number of other journals. And I think that's an important point that I wanted to put across today is that I review for quite a number of journals across our field. Um, and I think that's an important thing we'll talk about later on in the in the session. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much, um, all three panelists. I'm looking forward to hearing your uh, gems and words of wisdom around your um, roles as editors in chief, to use the correct terminology. Um, I also skillfully managed to um, get around the difficulty of having to accurately pronounce correctly all of your um, surnames as well. So thanks for that. Um, for those uh, who are just joining us um, or those who have already joined us, we've sort of got five things we'd like to achieve in the next um, period. Uh, we want to give you a sense of just how rich the open literature is since we're here to celebrate open learning and open education week. Um, we also want to give a little bit of a spotlight to the three journals in particular. Um, all three journals have a strong European flavour. Um, they have European editors in chief and um, a great sources of information and reading. So hopefully we'll give you a really good sense of the three journals. We also want to, on a more sort of personal note, share some of our own golden nuggets or good nuggets in terms of what we read. Um, I'm going to sort of shift out a moderator role um, on a couple of occasions just to share some of the uh, literature that we've identified last year, but I'll be also inviting the editors-in-chief to share their own picks. Um, and then from an editor's perspective, perhaps even wearing two hats, we're going to hear a little bit about what it makes to have a really good article. Two perspectives, one as the editor, but I guess also we're all readers, we always look at the titles and maybe get as far as the abstracts. What, what is it that makes a good article? And um, the last part is really uh, sharing our experience because there is such a wealth of literature. How do you navigate through that literature to identify those golden nuggets or open nuggets? And what strategy should you use? And so we'll, towards the end, talk about some of the experiences. So I said there's a wealth of literature um, in the area. Uh, a publication from 2016 in AJET, the Australasian Journal of Education Technology, identified over 270 open access journals in the field, and there are more. Um, and that's a bias towards English speaking journals, I should also emphasize. So there is a wealth of literature. Um, apologies for a little bit of self-promotion here, but our own National Institute does keep a pretty comprehensive list of these journals. If you're not familiar with them all, they're not all there, but that's for a reason. We try to curate um, the ones that we think would be best reading. Before I turn to the panel, um, I'm going to just give you the opportunity in the chat box to, as we're talking um, over the next five or ten minutes, to let us know what your number one top source of good reading, what do you turn to to keep yourself up to date? Um, so that's a question for our participants today. Um, and if you want to publish a link at any point to your top read from last 2020, or at least even for the start of this year, then I encourage you to do that as well. You might want to explain the reason behind your selection. But at this point, what I'd like to do is now hand over to our editors to um, Tell us a little bit about the scope of their journal, um, the type of publications it seeks and it publishes, um, its history, anything you would like to share with our participants just to let them know a little bit more about the publication. And there may be some people who are new to your publication. So I'm going to start with the same order. I'm sorry, it's a bit boring, but it just seems to make sense on this occasion. So in a yeah, thank you. Sorry, I lost a bit of the connection, but uh, just briefly about open praxis. Open praxis is focused on uh, any research or innovation in uh, open distance and e-learning, and mainly in higher education. We have published some uh, papers related to other educational levels, but our focus is mainly in higher education. So we share the focus with many other uh, general journals about distance education and e-learning. And we, our main uh, type of papers are research-based. We, we also have a, um, innovative practice papers, which are really interesting, but most of the papers we, we receive are research. Re uh, diverse. Sorry. The, the topics are very diverse. Um, 
we have been covering a lot of um, of issues in in this field and in the first years we published some specific um, dedicated issues about uh, student support services about assessment about the concept of openness but re more recently we uh, we have open issues so we receive very uh, diverse type of of paper with different topics. And one, one specific, special characteristic we have is that uh, we have partnered for some years with the Open Education Global Conference. Um, before it was the Open Education Consortium Conference. So we have had a lot of papers related to, for instance, open educational resources, open educational practices, and this, this sort of, uh, of papers. And specifically related to the conference, but for our, our open issues as well. Um, so this would be the overview. Well, thank you very much. And apologies, folks, if you're getting a little bit of broadband disruption. I know that uh, Mairead is struggling at the moment from her location. Um, of course, Open Praxis is the journal of the International Council for Open and um, Distance Education, ICDE. And um, you can subscribe to get a journal alert. Um, a lot of people perhaps aren't aware of that. You can subscribe and get alerts when publications come out. And maybe I'm sharing one of the tips at the end of how you navigate the literature and keep on top of things. Uh, Fim, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, the journal that you're now editor-in-chief of? And perhaps this, in your case, is as much about your plans for the future as well. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, uh, the, the journal I'm representing here is uh, EuroDL, uh, the European Journal of Open Distance and E-Learning. Uh, let's say the home journal uh, of, of Eden. Um, yeah, the, the, the journal itself uh, is, is, is open for all kinds of, uh, um, yeah, sort of, of, of research topics. Um, and um, we are especially looking at papers uh, that are dealing with uh, open and distance learning in, 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 in rather traditional contexts, um, but also in, in, in more advanced, more innovative uh, contexts. Uh, so we are also looking at uh, new technologies, new learning uh, approaches, uh, new concepts. Um, we are, of course, also looking at uh, things uh, related to quality, quality issues, uh, accreditation or not, uh, badges, uh, open uh, badges, uh, these kind of things. Um, and uh, we are also looking at uh, uh, more general topics, uh, especially also focusing on the European uh, context um, and, and, and addressing the issue of cultural aspects uh, related to open distance and e-learning. Um, I think that this is a very important uh, aspect of the journal. Uh, we also ask, for instance, um, to provide your abstract in a common language, which is English, of course, uh, but also in a second European language, uh, well, European language, uh, in, in a second language, uh, to just um, yeah, illustrate the point of these cultural differences. Um, so that is a very particular aspect uh, of, of, of our journal. Um, uh, Mark asked me to, to talk about the plans. Uh, well, um, the, the, there is the, the, the issue of uh, improvement of uh, the quality of the journal. Uh, although we are already having a history since since 95, uh, we still believe that we could improve the quality of the journal, uh, quality also of the process uh, in, in which you can submit and we can review the papers, uh, quality in, in, in uh, dissemination uh, about uh, what, what has been published uh, in, in, in the journal. Uh, so that is certainly something that we would like to work on. Uh, we would also like to work more on, on uh, special issues or, or maybe special tracks in the in the journal uh, as we now moved to to open publication format uh, you can publish your paper um, continuously uh, during the year uh, so but maybe we now have to to uh, also think about uh, some some special topics uh, that we could raise uh, and and try to um, to to attract papers uh, on, on these topics uh, and then there is uh, some other issues uh, that uh, maybe I can tell later uh, when we are answering the other questions that you have in mind, Mark. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much, Vim. And um, I can say for my Irish colleagues, that's not just Mairead, because I know from the participant list, we do have some Irish colleagues here that we have published an article that has uh, an Irish translation um, to meet the criteria of other European languages. Um, I should also just call out uh, a note in the chat from Leo, um, the Journal of Research and Learning Technology published by Alt. There wasn't really space to have uh, more panelists today, but I'd be remiss if I didn't call that particular journal out as an open access publication, because I know both Mairead and myself serve on the editorial board. So Mairead, that's a handover to you now to tell us a little bit about the journal that you're co-editor in chief of. Um, Bran, thanks, Mark. Um, and I suppose before I started, I should also say, you know, as I'm co-editor-in-chief with Joseph du um, Duart and Irina Volodense and Alvaro Galve. So we work together as a great team looking at what comes in um, from us. And I suppose one of the distinctive features of the International Journal of Educational Technology and Higher Education, I suppose, is the international focus, on, focus of it. You know, we recently published some of the infographics of some of them. Um, of what we had done in the previous year. And I think from that, it's really clear to see the international flavor and the breadth, you know. So I know that the focus of potentially some of the journals here today could be particularly in Europe, but I like the way this journal has a really a broad international remit um, and we're publishing and we are publishing authors from across the world. And I think that's really, really good. Um, as with the other journals, we are quite focused on digital learning and technology enhanced learning in higher education. We're looking at the theoretical application. We're looking at theoretical, you know, considerations and concepts. We're looking at, um, you know, applied practice. We're looking at innovation. We're looking at all of those things. I think, you know, Vim said there, one of the really interesting pieces, and we'll potentially talk about this later, you know, is looking beyond sort of, the single application of a specific technology, but looking at more of the situated context and I suppose nuances on cultural practice of technology and um, enhanced learning and things like that. So I think that really has that really comes to the fore within the journal. Um, and going back to sort of that infographic thing, I think one of the things that we really appreciate and we're trying to look at is that you know you see that we're we're trying to focus on in the journal is it's been as <clears throat> representative and as diverse as possible, whether that's from, you know, a geographical diversity, but also from gender diversity and also from different practices and also with respect to um, looking at different topics in the area. And one of the key things that I think us as a co-editorial board have brought together is that we're looking at the development of a number of special issues in key key areas you know, um, for instance, we're going to have a special issue. We have a special issue call out for micro credentials and um, a little bit of self-public uh, promotion here, as Mark would say. But we'd be grateful for those across the world who are interested in this topic and are working in this area to, to um, that. But we have other ones going. And I, this comes back also to something that Finn said, you know, the notion of being able to publish in a variety of languages and focusing. So we will have a special issue which will be regionally focused and my co-editor-in-chief, Alvaro, will look after that. So we're we're trying to do things to innovate even within the publishing um, sphere. We're also trying to innovate in different areas with regards to, you know, from our, you'll see from our stats, if you look at them from um, the infographics, which is on our website, our Springer website, is that we have a huge number. We have, a, you know, we, we receive a huge number of uh, submissions. But we also um, have to reject quite a number of them even before they get to the review process. And um, so I think we're trying to work with authors and we're trying to put in place mechanisms to help the standard that comes into us to be that to be written. And we might have we'll be announcing and hopefully have a few more things to come out to help authors get by and to, um, to proceed along the publishing journey. But I, I think that's enough said for myself and we can move on, Mark. 
Well, thank you, all three. Um, and uh, I would also be in trouble with my Irish colleagues if I didn't acknowledge Tom Filey's um, link there to the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning. Um, I'll scroll up the chat and see if I've missed anyone else out. But if there are publications that um, you go to, please do post them and share them with others. What I think we heard there was the wealth and um, the depth and breadth as well of the publications. And I can speak, and I'm just now sort of moving out of moderator role for a moment. I can speak with some confidence about just how much literature there is because our team for the last five years now, at the end of each year, um, or we do this throughout the year, but it comes to a head um, at the end of the year, we identify what we call our 10 top reads. We do publish the criteria of what we mean by top reads. We're not making any claims when we do this to say they're the best. Um, you can decide that for yourself. But in the criteria we use, since Mairead mentioned it, diversity is one of the features. And I just thought I'd take a couple of minutes to share with you some observations from our top 10 reads from last year. Actually, we ended up doing two lists, two lists of top 10, because we did a special COVID-19 um, issue uh, or selection. We felt that there was enough literature that had come through that it warranted a special list. So interestingly, um, joint uh, authorship is the norm. It's in um, the publications that we've looked at. And when I say we've looked at, we probably went through 500 different journal articles to refine it down to 100, to get it down to eventually 10. It's a pretty complex process. Um, we unfortunately, in some respects, couldn't find enough that fit in, fitted into the European um, links or uh, publications this year. But on the other hand, part of what we also, in our selection of good reads, we quite deliberately look for articles that people may not find in the mainstream. So just because the article doesn't come from one of the journals that we're talking about today doesn't mean it's not a good read, but we're deliberately trying to get people to look elsewhere and constantly looking for Latin America places. Of course, the English bias um, becomes quite a challenge. Um, the Australasian Journal of Educational Technology, for the first time uh, after four years, was not in the top place. Um, so that wasn't by design necessarily, but it certainly has taken that uh, ranking over the previous periods. And there were four new journals in the list in our top 10 this year. We'll put a link in the chat box if you aren't able to find it uh, to the link to the, the list. And, but in part, those four new journals were again by design because part of our criteria, as I said, was trying to look for things elsewhere out of the mainstream. Um, just to give you a sense, this was the top article that we identified. It may not resonate with all, but it resonated with us in particular because it mentioned really about the importance of there being a much stronger nexus between research and teaching. Um, it's no good for the research community to sit isolated and just publish and uh, make comments on what's going on. Research needs to actually have impact on practice and, of course, practice back again on research. I won't spend time sharing um, and talking about the others, but the list on our website does create, create and explain the selections for each of them. So for those of you who haven't come across this, it may be useful to be aware of. Um, just a couple from the list that I said that we had um, selected for our top 10 COVID-19 reads. We didn't list these in any kind of rank order because we felt that it would be quite inappropriate, very hard to make such a judgment. But again, if uh, you haven't come across this, we invite you to have a look at the list of um, articles that were selected. And I note already this year, several special issues have come out with more reflections on our COVID experience. So um, apologies for that kind of interruption and moderator role to being a little bit of a presenter there for a minute, but I want to return to our editors-in-chief and put them on the spot a little bit now and ask, um, what was your top read last year and why? Is there something, and I'm not referring here to the ones that we've identified, is there something from your own journal that really stood out for you or something that you think people should look at, that, um, whether it's your top read, but something that you think people should read for whatever reason? I'm going to go in reverse order this time to be a bit unkind um, without having prompted my uh, panellists. So, Mairead, do you have anything that you 
want to share that sort of is in your bucket list? Um, it may be something you still have to read, but it's there sitting to read. Um, I actually have two, and it's actually one of the ones that didn't make one of the top 10 um, for ours. And I was, even though I um, lobbied and canvassed it for it, um, but it was one of the ones, I think this is, this article for me really, well, it, it's in an area that I'm quite interested in anyway, but also I think from structurally and from how it's presented and also how, and how it's, um and how it's sort of formulated is really, really interesting for those who want to sort of are interested in about submitting journals and learning how what's a great example of one. So that one, this one is uh, negotiating and um, growth of online education in higher education. Neil Morris was their principal author, but there was other authors there as well. Maria Ivanchka, Taran Koop. Um, Radha Moglachi and Bronwyn Swinerton. Um, it was published in our journal actually um, last year. I didn't particularly, I didn't focus on it in particular, particularly because it came from our journal, but actually for me, it was, the structure of it is just a really, really well done. It's really well, it's a simple question, the way that they have approached the study and the design of it. They don't make exaggerated, you know, they don't make exaggerated sort of claims within it. They position their research really, really well. The literature review is is so, so strong. Um, you know, it's on point. It's not, it's a type of literature review that you read it easily, if you know what I mean. Um, and you're reading it and it's informative. It's Clothes, it's you know and it, it gets you to question your own sort of principles so I think your own sort of standpoint so I really enjoyed it from that perspective the study is really a simple simple design you know it's an engagement with um, top strategic leaders um, in a number of institutions a small number of institutions um, and I think that's an important point because sometimes you know a lot of authors believe that they have to have huge numbers involved if they're going to publish research on but actually it's a small number the design of it is really really simple but it's presented really really well um presented really really well so i i really enjoyed um this article in particular because of just it was engaging its findings were relevant and it was also positioned so so well within the literature and it brought the literature forward and it was clear from me from the outset how they were adding to the literature in this area and this is the area of you know the unbundling of higher education and the market forces that are influencing how the strategic positioning of um, universities etc so this one to me was a winner and um, definitely it didn't appear in our top 10 for the nidl but absolutely one of those ones that it was just so easy to read get engaged with and critique and it was one that i've gone back to and reread a few times and taken thoughts from it and critiques and that's always for me is a sort of a sign of a good journal when you go back to it and you think about um, something that the authors have said um, and it's easy to reflect on so yeah that would have been my, um, my favourite one of last year Mark All right, you said you had two, but if you do want a second one, come back in at the uh, after the yeah, others. I, I, have, want to, uh, I didn't want to hog the floor, so I come. I let the others come in, but I, ha I do have a second one, which I'm a bit of a, where I'm a bit of an advocate for. But um, I let the other editors go, and then I might come back in at the end, Mark. And if it's possible um, to share the link in the chat box to yeah. any of the articles, that would be great. We can follow up once we get into sort of the Q and A, folks. If you're waiting for some of those links. Um, so, uh, Vim, you're in the middle still, um, so handing over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, when, when uh, I was reading the question, what was your top read from 2020? Um, it, it's difficult to, to, um, to, to just mention one article, uh, and I've chosen a book, um, if, if you don't mind, an, an open access book. Uh, I've put already the link in the, um, in, in, in the chat. Uh, it's, it's a book, uh, um, yeah, of course, uh, it, it, it's uh, in this specific year of uh, COVID-19, uh, there is many more publications uh, about the pandemic and and how higher education reacts. Um, but this one is is particular uh, for for me. Um, it's uh, describing the situation in South Africa. 
Um, it, it also illustrates uh, my interest in, in uh, development cooperation and in uh, working together with uh, yeah, colleagues in, in, in different continents, uh, especially also in Africa and Latin America. Um, and um, yeah, the, the book is written by, by colleagues I know very well in, in, in Stellenbosch. Um, I know that Stellenbosch wants to profile itself as a, as a research-based university, and, and so they uh, invited different people um, from their own university, but also a, a bit larger community uh, to reflect on uh, the changes, uh, the rapid changes um, that had to uh, be implemented uh, very quickly in, uh, in, in different universities. And especially in a country like South Africa, you can imagine that this had uh, a lot of impact uh, on, on what happened in higher education. Uh, so it's rather a bundling of, of different uh, reflections uh, um, I, I know in, in, in South Africa, these reflections are also very much based on, on action research in, in the universities. Um, and, and so that's also uh, part of the, let's say, the, 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 the common ground that you can find in, in, in reading these articles uh, in the book. Um, so I think that uh, I, I already started reading the book, Mark. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you could also mention something that you still have to read. Well, I could only read part of the book yet. Uh, but it gives uh, a lot of inspiration uh, and it, 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 it gives a warm feeling, let's say, uh, when you're reading the stories uh, and uh, uh, the way that people in, in a country like South Africa have dealt with uh, the pandemic there. So that's my, uh, my top read. Uh. I was hoping to go away from today with at least one or two extra articles to read, but you've given us a book, so that's a bit more time required. Um, Ines, do you have a, a particular pick that stands out for you, whether it be from your own journal or some somewhere else? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, in fact, I'm going to talk about open practice because I misunderstood the question and I didn't think about my personal top read, readings, but the most read papers in open practice from last year. So we had more than 30 papers published. And the, I have uh, listed the, the top three most visited ones. And I tried to guess why people like those papers or visited those papers. And it makes sense to me. I, I will tell you the, the, the titles. One is about the uh, e-learning readiness as a predictor of academic achievement in higher education. And this was published before the pandemic, but I think uh, currently it makes a lot of sense that people are interested in learning about e-learning readiness and self-regulated learning, self-directed learning, motivation, and this type of issues because the e-learning has become so mainstream or blended learning or uh, online learning due to the pandemic that I think it makes sense that this is one of the top reds. Second one is a, an evaluation of a, on in your in the list you made in uh, Ireland, uh, not in the top ten, but also as a recommended reading. And of course, it's a very hot topic: proctoring and online assessment. So this is one our second most visited paper last year. And the third one is about a student satisfaction in online learning during the pandemic. And I think this is also another very relevant issue nowadays. It's about a student's perception of how they are leaving the pandemic and the, the transition to e-learning, all the wellness and support, uh, student support services aspects. So these are the, the top three in, uh, in open praxis. And Thinking about me, uh, it's hard to say one one reference, but I just would like to mention that I, because I'm, I'm I also read uh, literature that is not published in English, but it, of course in this forum and uh, in international forum, publications in English are on top. But there are also other quite relevant publications in, in Spanish, particularly, that I, I also like to read. And I, I, I strongly recommend your list. This year list and previous year list, it's very interesting to, 
to, to check that at the end of the year and then have a look to all the, your selection. So thank you. Well, thanks for um, also alerting us to what will come up towards the end of the conversation, strategies for how you manage your choices and what it is you choose to read and not to read. Um, by identifying the articles out of the top downloads, that's certainly one of the strategies that I use when I'm looking to see in a journal what is it that I should be noting. Um, not always a, a good predictor, um, and I wonder the readiness article may have been particularly timely because the European Commission had a funding round that had a focus on readiness, so that may have added another dimension. Um, I'm going to come to a question in a minute that we have in the chat and the Q&A from Tom, because it's relevant to our next sort of series of questions to our editors. Um, what it is that makes a, a good journal article and what Tom asks is kind of related in that we said at the outset, we're serving two purposes as both editors here, but also as um, scholars and readers and, and practitioners ourselves. Um, so you can answer that uh, question that's there, particularly the first one, um, in both of those uh, modes, if you like. But Tom also goes and asks, what is it that um, gets an article past the first hurdle? So I think what he's referring to there is a submission. Um, what does a submission um, need to have in it to get past the first hurdle to even be understood or thought of as potentially a good article? So there's a couple of questions thrown in the mix there. Um, who would like to go first? I don't feel the need to single anyone out. So jump in if you have a comment. I'm happy to give a comment just to keep the conversation. So I think one of the things that... Um, is really, really important is a clear alignment, you know, with the journal's objectives. You know, sometimes it's really clear. It's really clear when that happens. And as I said before, it's an easy read, you know, immediately. Sometimes what I you feel that there hasn't been enough consideration of the focus of the journal so that when the article was written, it was written in a vortex, you know, and potentially that the authors or author hadn't sort of uh, aligned their article with what the journal is about because at the end of the day independent of whichever journal you're coming from or that w and that we represent and others we have particular focus um, and it's or and it's important that it is aligned the other thing is is that the abstract or the or the initial elements of the um paper that is submitted really position what the paper is about um, you know, sometimes you can go through a whole paper and not really, really understand what the authors were trying to achieve in that. So, again, it's really having a clear proposition on a research question. That might seem superbly basic, but actually it's critical. It's central, I think, from um, my perspective anyway. I don't know what the other uh, editors might think. Yeah. Mark, can I continue? Uh um, I, I think uh, what, what Harriet just said is, is, is um, also very important, I think, uh, for, from my point of view. Um, what I usually um, um, find important is, is, is the story that is told in the paper. Um, and that starts with the title. Uh, the title should be attractive. Um, it, it should, it, it, it should yeah, attract your attention uh, as a reader. Um, and of course, the title should also cover then the contents of the paper. Um, so, but, but the title is the first thing that you see when, when, when a paper is submitted or when you see a paper published. Uh, so the title should should yeah spark your interest. Let's say uh, interest as a reader, but also as a reviewer, as as an editor. Uh, and then you go further after the title. Uh, you 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 read the abstract, uh, and and the abstract should also be very well formulated. Um, it it should give you a good overview of what what are you going to read in the paper. Uh, so and 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 that should like like has been said, it should be very well aligned with the contents of the. The, the topics uh, and 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 the focus of uh, of, of the journal, um, but it should also add something extra, something that 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 you yeah that that you haven't seen before, let's say. Uh, so that should also made clear in in uh, in, in the abstract. Uh, what is the uh, why should the reader read your 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 paper? Um, 
And I think that the, this is important uh, for me, uh, the title, the abstract. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you, you continue uh, the, 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 the the story that is told in the paper should be well structured, uh, should be uh, organized in, in a proper scientific way, and, and, and you should sort of immediately see from the layout of the paper uh, that that the person, the, the authors, uh, that they yeah that they know what they are talking about, that they know to, to sell their subject, their paper, uh, and and yeah, a good structure helps. Uh, a, a good uh, yeah, uh, a, a few pictures maybe. Uh, some some graphics, uh, the, the statistics, the tables, uh, the, the yeah, the layout should also be sort of uh, appealing to 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 the reader and and, and the reviewer. Uh, I think it's maybe, of course, the science and the research is very important. The contents is maybe the most important aspect, uh, but I also think the other things are, are quite important. Uh, a good title, a good abstract, a nice layout, a good structure, something that immediately triggers your attention and that you think, yes, that's a paper that I want to to delve into. Uh, well, that's a great answer, I have to say, and I loved your um, metaphor of storytelling as well. Yeah. Um, and some of the um, sort of criteria, if you like, you list uh, there and is not dissimilar to what we look at in the NIDL annual list, something that just stands out. And I just personally couldn't emphasize enough that title. You have to be careful you don't get too clever. I've had that challenge myself. But Ines, do you have any uh, words of wisdom that you can share with our participants? Yeah, thank you, Mark. I Well, I agree, of course, with my, my colleagues about the general characteristics of a, of a paper to be accepted. And for the question in the, in the chat about why some papers get rejected before the peer review, I think that was the question. In my experience, uh, it's because they are out of topic. So as my Merrick said, it, they don't adhere to the journal scope and focus. And sometimes you get submissions totally out of topic from chemistry or pharmacology. So totally, um, what's this? <laughs> That's unusual, but it happens sometimes. But also, here it's different, uh, it depends on the size of the journal. And I think uh, EuroDL and Open Praxis are more or less similar size. So we get similar number of submissions per year, less than 100. So we don't need to be so selective as other journals that get 1,000 submissions. So in that case, in those cases, they can reject the paper only because it doesn't adhere to the a APA style for references, despite the content. In our case, we, we could be, or in open practice, I mean, I can be more, uh, not, not so demanded at, the, at that first stage about the references, but it, it has to be mended by the, by the end if it gets accepted. But some gaps that are some common in the papers that get rejected not uh, clear enough about the objectives or the methodology, it, it's not clearly explained, or there is not any theoretical or conceptual background section. So these are very relevant gaps that can make a paper not be uh, sent to peer review. And also about format, I strongly recommend the, the authors to, to check the journal guidelines. For instance, we, we sometimes get papers which are four times longer than we recommend. So really long, long papers. So we can we have to say, okay, the topic is interesting, but you need to adhere to the guidelines and shorten the paper. So, or the opposite, very short papers for five pages, which are not enough. So maybe they look that they come from conferences and they have not been developed enough to for to peer view and can get accepted and good, good general articles, as you said in, in your question. I can, I, well, adding to what they, my previous, my colleagues said previously, I think in, especially in international journals, it's very important to explain, to give some contextual information. 
or local information because uh, there are different ways of call of naming the institution, the degrees, the courses, the gradings, and this needs an explanation. So authors have to be aware that the readers may be from anywhere in the world, not, not local. So in some contextual information about acronyms or specific characteristics of the context, I, I think that's very important. And the a clear structure of the paper, I think. people can really understand the argument, follow the paper. So I think those are some key key aspects. Once again, some excellent advice there. Um, I know there was a question in the um, Q&A that Mairead answered from someone about how you formulate a good title. Um, is it a question or a statement? It could also be a metaphor of some kind. Um, but mindful of my previous observation about being careful not to be too clever, I recently, with a couple of colleagues, presented a paper on Foo Foo the Snoo. Um, I'll leave you to look up my uh, bio page to see what that was about. Um, moving on, um, and we've sort of covered some of these questions already, so I don't think we, we want to go over old ground. Uh, and in the intros to your journals, you also indicated interest in special issues and the like. So I'm just wondering, wearing your editor-in-chief's role, um, what is it that you would really like to publish this year? Um, and I guess COVID is going to be part of that, but at the same time, there's lots else still going on and um, beyond COVID. So I'm going to hand over again to whoever wants to come in first with the mic with these sort of questions here. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, where you see gaps and what it is you would invite a publication on. Can I start, Mark? Yes, go for yeah. it. Um, and and I, I would not give the evident answer related to COVID. Uh, I, I think um, what, what I'm uh, thinking more and more nowadays is that, um, and, and it, it, it's, it's about interdisciplinary research. Um, one, one of the things that, that I find very difficult uh, is, is, yeah, um, finding good papers that, that start from, from an interdisciplinary approach. It's not just bringing two disciplines together. Uh, for instance, engineering education uh, is, is, I'm an engineer, but I forgot to mention that uh, in, in the introduction. Uh, but um, the, it, 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 it's more than, than, than just bringing two disciplines into one paper. Uh, how do you educate engineering students? Uh, um, and, and how do you do that in an open or distance uh, way uh, like we are now doing? In, in, in pandemic times, uh, I think it's it's really trying to to understand, let's say, the different ways, uh, the different frameworks uh, that exist in research and education, in research in uh, in engineering, uh, which is yeah sometimes a totally different world, uh, and bringing that together into one paper uh, that that is uh, good enough for the engineers and at the same time good enough for the educators uh, for the educational scientists uh, that is that is a very hard uh, uh, hard thing to do um, and so if we talk about where do I see gaps in the literature uh, or in the possibilities to publish your research, uh, I think that the the the, the whole issue of of interdisciplinary research is something that I would like to to, to emphasize here. Um, and how can we, yeah, foster um, people, uh, foster, yeah, a, a, a genuine interest in uh, in, in uh, trying to understand the other sides, uh, trying to understand the other discipline, and trying to convince the reviewers, for instance, educational scientists, that an engineering approach um, is is maybe from a totally different nature than their uh, approach. Approach and and that there is value in that uh, and vice versa. How can we try to, yeah, to find ways to 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 combine these two worlds, uh, and not just two. If we talk about interdisciplinary, it might be even more than two disciplines working together. Uh, so and I would like to, to to see more on 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 that. Uh, an element of sort of border crossing there. The mind, yeah. I hear that, um, of yeah. course. To answer that question about what makes a good article, it should be making a contribution to new knowledge and so yep. bringing together different disciplines, different areas. Yep. 
Uh, Ines, do you have any uh, thoughts at all? Um, yes. Um, I really don't want to go into content or what, what gaps I see in the literature because I think, um, well, people are doing research and innovation in different fields. So I, I, I would put the focus on providing um, or writing papers with a strong background and with a strong methodology, uh, regardless the type of methodology and that is correlation, qualitative studies, case studies, but uh, the articles I would like to publish are with a strong methodology and rigorous methodology and a strong background. And with a strong background, I especially would like to refer uh, to the big amount of papers that we are um, receiving nowadays um, uh, about the impact of the COVID. Because I think there, um, especially um, authors or researchers who come from um, face-to-face -face universities that have to move uh, to remote learning, the, the background or the literacy review and previous research they consult sometimes is not enough. So I, I think there is a open and distance education uh, and Eden and ICD are two representatives of this, uh, this work and this long story. So I, I, I would uh, put a stress on that. Um, and also on highlighting the what, what you just mentioned, which is the contribution of the paper on originality or innovation. And one thing I, I would like to, well, if I can, to promote in open practice is the publication of innovative practice. I think it's very relevant to, to test different methodologies or technologies or innovation and then do a proper evaluation of that and publish it as a case study. I think this is a very useful also for practitioners and it is a research, but very practice-based research. I think that's maybe a, a gap. But well, thank you again. Some really interesting and... Uh, <laughs> Any paper which is strong in um, background and methodology and rigorous, it, it's welcome, I think. And apologies, Ines, you just cut out for a minute, so I, um, I popped in thinking that you'd finished there. Uh, so what I took from one of the uh, statements is don't misinterpret storytelling for weak methodology. Um, the balance of maintaining um, the two is not an easy thing at the same time as contributing new knowledge. Marae, do you have uh, anything to add to the conversation? Yeah, Mark, just to pick up on some of the points, but also I think, you know, gaps in the literature, I think it's, you know, there's some clear gaps obviously out there. I think what Vim has highlighted is one of the things, it's a bugbear of mine, in one way, it's that when potentially authors will come into the field or start out in the field, they will presume that it's novel, a novel theory that only relates in within educational technology and they won't or digital learning. And they won't have looked around potentially at those other disciplines which are on the I suppose which are on the border and intersect with our own discipline. And that sometimes for me is a weakness. Um, it's a massive weakness. And I think there's some lovely, I think that's where we call for authors just to dig a little bit deeper and to go outside out of the discipline area and to do that notion of interdisciplinarity. I think one of the things also I think that Inez mentioned was, you know, this notion of really, really strong research design, independent, the types of literature, the types of sort of articles we want are really strong research design. As I said, you know, in my own favorite one, the research design was super strong. It was, you know, one of those things where they really called out on the strengths of qualitative research. They didn't try to dress it up and put it out into some other form of research to make it appear more scientific in that type of way. I think that's sometimes some of the problems that we'll get. And the absence of context is another issue that I would think is a really a contextualized critique 
you know, in and around um, some of the studies that are presented. Sometimes you can find findings which are quite um, limited in their breadth because actually the authors haven't thought to contextualise it. They haven't placed it well, their study well within the literature. And that's really disappointing because their study may indeed have good substance, but actually it doesn't allow the reader to build. It doesn't make those bridges for them and it doesn't um, contribute in the way that it should um, for the reader. So I think those are the type of things that I would like to see embraced by embraced by authors but also the journals and I think some of the things that we're looking at you know instead of just um this goes to some of the COVID work is that instead of you know about the simple narratives and actually I'm quite a strong advocate of narrative as a research method is to move on from that and to think about of it the situated and the social interactive um that that type of research allows to bring in that it brings into it and the richness of the methodology that can bring to the to the um article as well so for me another thing i think is another one is is that um and this goes back to what are you looking for in an article it's sometimes it's the burning question the burning question of the researcher and that really comes true and you can see a lot of the articles that are, have been published across our journals and in other journals, you really get the feeling that a lot of those authors are totally immersed in what they're doing and therefore it comes across quite simply in their writing. Thanks, Mairead. Sorry, I just had needed to check my, my mic was on. Um, folks, we're, we're coming to the end. Um, we haven't had a huge number of questions, but I, I think the conversation has been very informative. I'm just going to ask the panel in, in wrapping up um, in no more than a minute each, just to give us perhaps one piece of advice in terms of what you might do to ensure that you're engaging in that literature, you're finding the literature, something as a tip, I shared the one previously about looking to see what ones have been downloaded on a personal note. If I just start off, the one thing I commit myself to do as a uh, scholarly professional is I make sure I read one journal article every single day. Um, so I, then I know that I'm going to at least cover a small slice of that literature. Um, without putting anyone on the spot, is there anyone who wants to start off with one piece of advice, one tip, to wrap up? Go ahead, Wim. Wim, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry, this is better. Um, it's it's a bit the same sort of remark as as, as you uh, just gave, Mark. Um, it, it, and that is um, something that helps me uh, as 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 an academic a scholar is uh, reserve one day in the week uh, for reading and writing. And uh, so, especially now, uh, while we are working from home, and 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 uh, th there is almost no difference between mornings and evenings, um, between weekdays and weekends. Uh, the, the, there is so many meetings happening um, that you maybe tend to forget that your real work is is uh, is, is reading and writing. Um, well, real work, the part of your real work is is reading and writing. Uh, and so, the only way that I could make it happen for for me is that I reserved one day in the week uh, where, and, and I announce it, it's, it's in my agenda, reading and writing. Uh, and that helps. Thank you, because I think that just underscores that to engage in the literature, to be a scholarly professional, you do have to be reading. Ines, do you have anything to share just very briefly? We're right on time now. Yeah, just briefly, I well, I recommend to 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 read and to to look to different sources, to different journals, and use the library, use the directory of open access journals. But always choose a how to say serious serious journals and serious publications. And there is a lot of literature about uh, on. and e-learning so I recommend to to have a, your eyes in different places because you can find interesting things anywhere it, it will depend of course of your personal interest the, the topic 
But um, here also interdisciplinarity, as Bin was mentioning, you can have interesting uh, input from journals from engineering or computer science from education, social science. So have a diverse, diverse, uh, an open, open mind. Excellent point. And Marae, final word from you. Yeah, so quickly, some of those things that have been said already, I think read with an objective is really, really important. So be clear about what objectives that you have in your reading style. I've generated a favourite authors list for myself. They're the people that I really get something from, which is also linked into, you know, in and around of what my peers are reading. So I'll regularly ask those that I engage with and collaborate with, what are you reading? Um, and I think that's important because, you know, you'll always find something that somebody else has happened upon and, and that's, uh, that, you know, it's something that can broaden your own horizon, as you say, and that's the open-minded part that in is. I think that one of the things that we should do, um, and I think this is important, this is important not only from open standards, but we should expect high standards when we read um, our literature and we should always have them in mind so that when we're reading, we're thinking about the quality of the article, the research design, the findings and how they're positioned and enjoy what you're reading, I suppose, as well is the, is the final thing I would say. Well, thank you very much, all three panellists. Uh, apologies for my Eden Admin team that we're a couple of minutes over. Um, if anyone ever gets interviewed by me for a job, uh, one of the questions I sometimes ask prospective candidates or candidates for the position is, what's the most interesting thing you've read in the last three months and why? And you'd be surprised just how that completely stumps many uh, professionals. So um, on that note, thank you very much. I hope it's been an informative conversation. You now know three editors-in-chief that if you want to follow up with, uh, even I'm sure you will find that if you follow up with an idea that you're working on, they might even be able to tell you whether it's suitable for the journal. What we will find from past experiences, if you engage with the editors actually and build a rapport, they will work very constructively with you. So um, no one is there to try to block a publication. They want to steer it in the right direction. And sometimes that's pointing you to a different publication. But I'm uh, over time. So thank you very much to um, our panelists. I need to also thank Diana for organising um, in particular this week. And none of this would be possible without the Eden admin team. So hopefully we'll see some of you back later this afternoon for the second webinar of the day. But in the meantime, have uh, a good afternoon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Well,